Welcome, my friends. Come with me, and you'll be in a world of purely the top ten favorite and best performances of the greatest actors of all time again. Okay, I'll stop singing. But yes, you stir crazy folks. I am starting from ten and then producing with my blanket. Other selections all the way up to number one. And stop. Reverse it. Thank you, my friends. I've seen every film attainable of every artist here, so each list comes from truthful, lovely, and sincere accuracy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Jewish American Heritage Month, and as hard as it is still being Jewish in America during these times, especially with the Palestine and Israel war, which is just awful, we won't talk about that today because it's a time to celebrate the heritage always. And how about we talk about one of the greatest treasures of film, period, who has created some of the most memorable characters in all of cinema, the wild man himself, Gene Wilder. Born as Jerome Silberman, but known quite a bit as Jerry in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, he came from Russian Jewish descent. Very prideful family indeed, but a strict and hard one. Jerry was always a small performer growing up with Laurel and Hardy, Sid Caesar, and the great Charlie Chaplin as being huge inspirations. The movie City Lights and The Circus being sincere inspirations. He grew the interest into theater by the time he was 11 and began studying religiously by the time he was 13, reading the likes of Shakespeare and his favorite, Anton Chekhov, even though he was sent off to a military institute in Hollywood called Black Fox. He then served in the army for two years as a medic. He came back home to study theater with a vengeance and grew to become one of the great artists of the stage. Trained at the famous actor's studio by Lee Strasberg himself with best friend Charles Grodin, he traveled around the country with regional theater, starring in productions of Much Ado About Nothing, Romeo and Juliet, The Cat and the Canary, to then making his big trek on Broadway with The Complacent Lover, The White House, and famously playing Billy Bibbit in the adaptation of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, opposite Kirk Douglas. It wouldn't be until the production of Mother Courage and Her Children, starring opposite Anne Bancroft, where he would meet the amazing Mel Brooks, and Gene's life would be forever altered, and ours too, for the better. Gene Wilder, ladies and gentlemen, has always meant a great deal to me growing up for the majority of his movies, played a huge part in my own childhood. As I've progressed in theater myself, it was one of the most inspiring things to learn how deep his roots were in the theater, and has always been an important part of his life. With his gentle exterior, his piercing blue eyes, his soothing soft voice, but his rage that could explode in a second was everything I connected to, and he became a symbol of how to electrify absurdist drama, how to treat any kind of text with the utmost truth. Of course, this is always about films, but I would be nuts not to at least mention his brilliant, brilliant Emmy Award-winning performance on everyone's favorite show, Will and Grace, as Will's boss, Mr. Stein. My lord, how he makes those two episodes absolutely everything on that show. Not to mention Gene's own short-lived sitcom, Something Wilder, which isn't exactly amazing, but whatever Gene touched, he gave heart and soul to. Though his filmography was quite tiny, Gene Wilder was always that lovable presence that took wilder-than-life concepts and grounded them with his heartfelt intelligence and spirit of wonder. And so, on we go! Walk this way. Don't get distracted with fizzy lifting drinks. Here are the top 10 best performances of the man who made life and film a little bit wilder, the candy man, the producer, the poet, Gene Wilder. Starting off at number 10, we have Murder in a Small Town, the first major television movie for A&E, arts and entertainment, that is, that has Gene Wilder playing Larry Carter, but everyone calls him Cash. And he's an ex-actor, Broadway director, who now lives in a small town in Stamford, Connecticut, working with a community theater. He tried to get money for the theater from a local prick millionaire, Sidney Lassiter, played really well by theater legend himself, Terry O'Quinn. But one day, Lassiter turns up dead. Murdered, in fact. And Detective Tony Baloney, played greatly by Mike Starr, I love that dude, needs Cash's help for Cash, always had a keen eye of human observation and can be a detective himself. 
Gene was a huge fan of the murder mysteries on a &E, like Cracker, Poirot with David Suchet, Sherlock Holmes, etc. So he approached a &E to work on one himself, so much that he was given the chance to write it, and was given free reign to write it, taking as long as three months. He focused on character and dialogue where his brother-in-law, Gilbert, focused on the structure. The result was A&E's biggest and highest rated movie on the channel since Colin Firth's Pride and Prejudice, mainly because it had the genius of Gene Wilder, just giving honest truth and charming quickness to the role that was so super simple. A character that we all can relate to, that we can immediately follow and be on his side. The network was excited for a whole franchise, but only one sequel was made, The Lady in Question, due to Gene's unfortunate diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. However, we can cherish Gene's entry and opportunity of constructing a story and character in murder mystery that's so lovely to watch every time. Number nine, The World's Greatest Lover. Gene's second directorial effort, written and produced, and songs written by the legend as well. Released in 1977 and is such a lovely, wacky, slapsticky love letter to silent cinema. With Gene and Carol Kane playing husband and wife, Rudy and Annie, traveling from Milwaukee to Hollywood, for Rudy is competing to be Rainbow Studios' World's Greatest Lover, which dictating producer Zucker, played hilariously by Dom DeLuise, is looking to replace the likes of Rudolph Valentino, the biggest silent film star of the time. The film itself is not necessarily miraculous, but you can't deny the enjoyable times you have watching Gene inhabit the qualities of Chaplin and paying tribute to silent film stars. He does have the bright blue eyes made for silent film, for they just pop like crazy along with Carol's. As a director, he certainly has a fare for comedy. It may not be so damn hysterical, but the sequence where they're about to get off the train and Rudy is declaring, he'll be the next big star. He'll stick out because he is truly unique. Cut to hundreds of men wearing the exact same suit he's wearing, preparing for the same thing. And then you have the absolutely beautiful moment and shot of Rudy on the set and seeing his female co-star as his wife, Annie, who just left him and he breaks down with the one tear and Gene Wilder delivers such a simple, soft and powerful speech that really does break your heart. The movie did financially greatly as opposed to its meh reviews, but any Gene Wilder fan finds this homage a loving experience. Number eight, Stir Crazy. The classic second outing with Gene and his good buddy, Richard Pryor, playing two best friends, an actor and a playwright who moved to LA, then stop in Arizona to get more money, working on a promotion, dressed up as woodpeckers with a song and dance routine. Once two dicks steal their costumes and rob a bank, they are the ones framed and captured, sentenced for 125 years, holy shiza. So it becomes a prison comedy leading to an adventurous escape, but we get a great amount of improv along the way. Of all films, we have a terrifically gifted director in the one and only Sidney Poitier, giving Gene and Richard all the freedom in the world to just fly, as he said it. And man, do they go off the frickin' rails, but they are too damn good that you can't dismiss it. It's not perfect by any means, God no. It can get maniacally goofy. But I fall in love with pictures where you can tell the actors really got along beautifully for a time and they were able to challenge themselves, grow as actors. And it was a fun process rather than a freaking drag, which we all can recognize. Needless to say, this film and performance drives me stir crazy every time I watch it. Number seven, everything you always wanted to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask. Oh yes, how I wish even this was much higher, folks, because you talk about a performance played so straight, so real, it is heartbreakingly hysterical. Adapted and directed by, yeah, Woody Allen. Gene, in one of seven segments, plays Dr. Ross, who has an affair with one of his patients. Just so happens that his patient is a sheep and he starts to fall in love with her the absolute absurdity is everything you'd expect in this segment let alone the whole film and this segment is for sure my favorite of the film because of gene's expert timing and sensitivity 
with the matter. Just substituting the sheep with a human woman was his methodology. Jean gives it so much life that is very, very reminiscent of an Ingmar Bergman or Fellini film, or hey, even in a Chekhov play. How he just loses his shit when the sheep goes back to her ex and is inspecting more sheep to match the love that he had is unbelievably wild. And it's this segment that got the movie banned in Ireland in the late 70s. I mean, with the segment title of What is Sodomy? Who knew? But Gene's performance is everything a classically trained theater artist adores for the Brechtian, Ionesco, Beckett level of absurdity we're dealing with here. Number seven, Silver Streak. Such a great mystery thrill ride of a film, which always reminded me of Hitchcock's North by Northwest, which Gene told Cary Grant himself it was an homage to it. Having Gene play a book editor, George, writing on the Silver Streak get it, who develops a little attraction with Hilly, played really well by Jill Clayburgh, channeling some simplicity of Ava Marie Saint. George sees a man falling from the train. He tries to report it and get help, but soon starts to figure out, maybe this was a murder, foul play. And now, he is next. So he needs the help of a car thief, Grover, played wonderfully again by Richard Pryor, in order to save Hilly and solve the mystery. The first partnership between Wilder and Pryor and the chemistry is obviously so fresh here and fantastic with Gene really embracing improvisation, thanks to Richard. Even though Pryor's screen time is significantly less, the last half of the film with them together is such a treasure, especially with the train station shoe polish scene where Grover has to help George how to be black and literally lather his face with shoe polish and get a stereotypical cadence of black people. Yes, it's still not okay. And Pryor even had a huge issue with this scene. So much that director Arthur Hiller and Gene allowed Pryor to rewrite this scene himself. So it would be funnier and inoffensive. And even though it's still a little cringy, Gene makes it work. Gene was so excited to take this role too, for it was his chance to play a real action-like hero mixed with his everyman persona. Nominated for an Oscar for Best Sound, this film still delights people to this day, but more so, Gene's fun leading performance, which earned him a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor. Number five, Quaxar Farchun has a cousin in the Bronx. A surprise, yes? Amazingly enough, folks, this is one of the greatest underrated performances of any actor in a small gem of an independent film, which stars Gene Wilder as our lead character, Quaxer Fortune, who makes the smallest living possible wheeling his wheelbarrow and collects horse dung and sells it to the townspeople. A true entrepreneur at heart, in the heart of Dublin, he is an all's well dysfunctionally normal until he meets Zazel, newcomer Margot Kidder, and becomes just as infatuated with her as she does with him. His fascination could trail him to New York City, and it could work out because he's got a cousin in the Bronx. This is everything that Gene Wilder loved doing. Different, interesting stories that test people's psyche and challenges the actor through the structure of absurdity, which Gene was so damn brilliant at. Jean Renoir wanted to direct it, and Gene met up with him, but didn't ultimately work out. But Gene gives so much soul to this performance with a pretty damn good Irish accent. It complements Gene's unique abilities of balancing quirky comedy with the most passionate and sincerely honest drama. He plays it so subtly where you think he's on the spectrum, maybe, and has special needs, but it's never as Kirk Lazarus from Tropic Thunder would say, yeah, you get it. He has so many beautiful moments in this, and not one of those really features him freaking out. Can you believe that? But one of the best is when he's confronting Zazel in New York, and all the horses in Dublin are being taken away, so that will crush his business, but also all the horses will be killed. And Zazel doesn't give a horse shit, and he is so insulted and hurt. She gets defensive with saying, don't be stupid, Quaxer, and how his face is straightened in sincerity. I'm not stupid, and their fight is hitting below the belt, and it's so heartbreaking to watch him. And that's the genius of Gene, is that he feels one with the character, no matter who he's playing. His performance was so praised that even the Women's News Service made a bid for Gene 
to receive another Oscar nomination, which I would have been happy if he did, that's for sure. So if you have the chance to catch this little gem, it's worth it for Gene alone. Number four, Blazing Saddles. You darn tootin' folks, imagining anyone else playing Jim the Waco Kid, who must have killed more men than Cecil B. DeMille, would be absolutely asinine, even though originally Academy Award winner Gig Young was set to play him, but was unfortunately such an alcoholic that Mel Brooks had to fire him after he collapsed from alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Gene represents the style of the faded alcoholic gunslinger so beautifully, just like Dino in Rio Bravo. He carries that same bravado so simply without overstating it. Originally, Gene was asked to play Hedy Lamar. Hedley. Oh, sorry. But Gene didn't feel right for it. And even though Mel didn't think Gene was right for Jim, Gene pulled out all the stops and brings the real gravitas to the film. Mel and Gene were back at it again after making their first film just seven years earlier and smashed racism in the face, but did it with the best satirical comedy that, of course, was ahead of its time. The chemistry between Wilder and Cleavon Little is wonderful as well. Both being theater actors, Wilder gave him some help for adapting to film and developed such a great friendship while filming. Even with some ad-libs like his poignant speech to Cleavon stating, you've got to remember that these are just simple farmers. These are people of the land, the common clay of the new west. You know, morons. Getting a genuine chuckle out of Little, for he wasn't expecting that line. Blazing Saddles still remains one of the greatest comedies of all time, and it has such a strong respect for its dealing with events and terror of racism with lunacy, satire, and love-made humor, with Gene adding the weight to it with the fastest guns around. Number three, The Producers. How I wish even this was much higher, for most notably folks, this remains Gene Wilder's first and his only Academy Award nominated performance for Best Supporting Actor and his true breakout role as Leo Bloom, everyone's favorite accountant hired to handle the books for Max Bialystok, an aging, scheming Broadway producer played absolutely brilliantly, of course, by Zero Mostel, romancing his way with Hold Me, Touch Me and the other elderly investors for his next play. Who the hell knows what that's going to be? Bloom, with his hysterics, finds a discrepancy and shares the fact that a producer can make more money producing a flop than a hit show by overselling interest and embezzling the funds. So off they find the best perfect trash show of all time with Springtime for Hitler. Planning to reap the rewards of such a catastrophically offensive show. I don't need to tell you folks how popular and iconic The Producers has become today, having been adapted into a famous Tony-winning Broadway musical with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, which was adapted again into a movie, but it's amazing how it wasn't like that in the beginning. Very ahead of its time, indeed, which Gene was certainly all about. What a perfect character for Gene to debut with this film. Leo Bloom, a neurotic who carries around his baby blue blanket for security. Gene said during that scene he did a sense memory when his little puppy ran after a ball in the pond and then was limping, dying only a short time later. So imagining his blanket was his puppy, caressing her dearly, which gives such truth and authenticity to his performance. And when Zero Mostel took it away, he was taking his puppy away, which made him go nuts. If Peter Sellers accepted the role originally, we would not have the beautiful performance we have from Gene here. That was also disliked by producer Joseph Levine, since he wasn't a big star, and in his mind, Gene was dragging the picture down. Mel promised he would find someone else, obviously never following through, for he trusted producers would forget. And the final film is not what it is without Gene. His valiant and mighty delivery of his hysterics, I'm hysterical, I'm in hysterics, splash of water, I'm wet. I'm wet. I'm hysterical and I'm wet. Slap. I'm in pain and I'm wet and I'm hysterical. It's just everything. Thanks to two Hershey bars and a huge cup of coffee Gene needed for that scene. Still regarded as one of the most controversial films of all time, this Oscar winner for best original screenplay is still beloved by Gene Wilder fans all over the world. For everyone holds the partnership between Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder as one 
for the Bucks. Number two, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I'm sure this is a little surprising to everyone, considering how strong the cultural significance this film and Gene's performance is. And believe me, folks, it was a tough one to even beat at number two. But Gene Wilder's iconic Golden Globe nominated performance as the Candyman himself, Willy Wonka, is held in millions of people's hearts and souls so dearly, combining such a masterful balance of eccentricity, joy, darkness, and realism. He first got the script and loved it, but there was something missing, so he told Stewart that he'll do it only if his introduction in the film includes a limp with his cane. He limps forward, sticks his cane in the ground, limps a bit more, stops, starts to fall, and then does a little somersault, popping right back up. Stewart's like, why do you want to do that? Wilder said, because the audience won't know when I'm telling the truth. And it's that little bit of brilliance that makes Gene Wilder the man. We love Wonka's style. We love how every question he's asked by the parents and the kids, he's always got a badass deflection, such as, I'm a trifle deaf in this year. Try speaking louder next time. Reportedly, he got along greatly with the kids, especially Peter Ostrom, who played Charlie, almost feeling like he was a mentor, always having lunch with each other and perfectly sharing a chocolate bar for dessert while walking back to set. He, of course, frightened the pants off of those vermicious canids with that boat sequence. And they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing. I remember when I first saw that shit when I was a kid, probably six years old, freak me the hell out. And I loved it. It's like my first exposure to a faux hammer horror film with those creepy student film shots. Anyway, Wilder just embraces all of the eccentric actions of Willy Wonka that makes him the ultimate. Even the second to the finale scene where he lets loose on Grandpa Joe and Charlie. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You get nothing. You lose. Which apparently both Jack Albertson and Peter Ostrom didn't know he was going to react that way. Which always gives to the heartfelt element of surprise. God, I love that. You don't tell your actors what you're going to do, you show them in the throes of it. And one of the most beautiful moments I always will remember is the unbelievably touching final scene in the Wonka Vader, where, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, it's been like 50 plus years, folks, come on. He gives the factory to Charlie for his whole family and to keep it going. How sweet and soft-spoken he is in the scene with Peter. It is so touching that you totally believe how good of a father figure he really is. There have been a few other Wonkas that came, like Johnny Depp's and Timothy Chalamet's, but also for the Wonka stage musicals. But the OG, Gene Wilder, will never, ever, ever be forgotten as the best. Speaking of which, you snozberries, here are some honorable mentions. See no evil, hear no evil. The third collaboration between Gene and Richard, which is not the greatest because the jokes wear thin after a while for... Richard plays a blind man and Gene plays a deaf man and together they must try to solve a murder and clear their framed names. Especially from frickin' Kevin Spacey. Ugh. Gene turned down the original script twice because it just wasn't funny and offensive until he was given freedom to rewrite it with Pryor. He went to the New York League for the Hard of Hearing to study students and members where he met one of the speech pathologists, Karen Webb, whom he fell in love with and became his fourth and final wife before his unfortunate death in 2016. As a hard of hearing actor myself, actually, sure, it's annoying to have hearing actors portray characters with disabilities who don't actually have experience, unless, unless they do proper and respectful preparation and study, which both Wilder and Pryor did. So I always give respect for their hearts being in the right place and still delivering a couple laughs. The Woman in Red, which don't be fooled, my friends. It's certainly not one of Gene's better directorial efforts or script adaptations, taking a lot of gimmicks from Billy Wilder's The Seven Year Itch. However, it's definitely honorable because it was Gene's most successful film at the box office, as far as a star, writer, and director, and even earned an Oscar for Stevie Wonder's iconic single, I Just Called to Say I Love You. Plus, it's the best film, which includes his dear love at the time, Gilda Radner, whom he later married while promoting the film. They remained married for five years until her unfortunate death from ovarian cancer. The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother. <laughs> 
Gene's Wilder directorial debut. See what I did there? You're welcome, but also written and of course starring the genius as the title character. Yes, the adventure. As the greatest detective in the world's smarter brother Sigerson, who lives in the shadow of his brother, whom he calls Sherlock. Get it? Until he gets a message from Sergeant Orville Sacker, Marty Feldman, to take cases for his brother. For being a slight parody, Gene's screenplay is really well devoted to the Sherlock Holmes lore, as is expected given to how big of a fan Gene was, adding in his own brilliant skills at fencing, of course, with some singing and dancing, like my favorite number, the kangaroo hop. It's just great fun, which I, I never expected in this film. Gene was going nuts making this picture because he wanted Mel Brooks to direct it, but Mel believed in Gene well enough to do it himself, and of course, it was a success, since the 70s were the greatest decade for Sherlock Holmes films, and Gene did the kangaroo hop on the bandwagon well for it. Start the Revolution Without Me, which features Wilder and co-star Donald Sutherland playing twins with quite a bit of humor. One set of twins are the hoity-toity aristocratic Corsican brothers, and the other set of twins are the oafish silly peasants, but both twins scheming to get by through the backdrop of the French Revolution. Over-the-top parody of Tale of Two Cities, as well as the Corsican brothers, with a mix of The Man in the Iron Mask. You have to give it up to both Sutherland and, of course, Wilder for portraying two sets of twins with wit. And Gene offers his fantastic skills at fencing again, which he learned from the old Vic school in Bristol, which you wish he had more opportunities to do more fencing on screen. Gene was originally offered the film adaptation of Catch-22, directed by Mike Nichols at the same time this was happening, but Gene chose this film due to the slim appearance of the character he was offered in Catch-22. Wise decision, for Gene gets to have more fun here. Bonnie and Clyde, Gene's first, first, first big break in film, playing Eugene, an undertaker being taken hostage slightly with his companion, played by Evans Evans, after the barrel gang steal his car. Just the simple expression, that's my car. Hey, that's my car. It's, it's so damn hilarious. To then going nuts again in the car, chasing after them. I'm going to tear them apart. Gene said it was incredibly freeing to work with Arthur Penn on set, which I can believe, one of the greatest directors frickin' ever. But this is a fun little Easter egg of seeing the stars before they become stars. And surely Gene was a phenomenal star in everyone's heart. Number one, Young Frankenstein. Do not deny it, folks. You immediately need to value and understand. Boy, what knockers. That Gene Wilder's performance is so damn iconic and mesmerizing as Dr. Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. Oh, oh, yes, sorry. It is the greatest addition and portrayal of the godlike doctor I've ever seen in my life. And without a doubt, Mel Brooks' best film. Thanks to the combining power of an Oscar-nominated screenplay co-written and conceived by Wilder, based of course on Mary Shelley's classic. This time, it's the grandson of Dr. Frankenstein, who wants nothing to do with the wackos that came before him, all the doo-doo that they did, but slowly over time, realizing his calling, but accidentally putting an Abbey Normal brain in his creation. While they were wrapping up on Blazing Saddles, Gene told Mel he wanted him to direct an upcoming script he had going, but the deal is, Mel can't act in it, because if he is going to act in it, the beautiful moments between man and creation won't work as well. There needed to be a balance within this homage. So Mel agreed, except for a few voiceovers as a screeching cat and villager. And it was so, so often running, having literally the best time shooting this film in the actual lab where they filmed the original Frankenstein with Karloff. The only wild argument Mel and Gene ever had was, of course, the putting on the Ritz number, where Gene was fighting for it. And Mel, Mel Brooks said, it was silly. Gene stood his ground and it was kept in, thank frickin' God, and still remains one of the greatest sequences in the whole film, even in film period. Gene always had great dancing ability, even carrying tap forward in his 70s. I can't even tell you, folks, how many times I've seen this film, and I am always in awe 
of Gene Wilder's performance. He is so dramatically dynamic for being a bit of a straight man to Marty Feldman's wild and flippin' brilliant Igor. They told me it was pronounced Igor. Well, they were wrong, weren't they? But how he explodes with Wilder electricity. Yes, pun intended. Dr. Frankenstein, are you all right? And his defiant declaration. My name is Frankenstein. It is just the perfect balance of over-the-top hilariousness with campy, campy hilarity to the most dynamic and brutally honest dramatic truth that it always remains a clear example how to handle comedy in such a satire. Premier Magazine still rates his performance here as number nine in their own top 100 of the greatest performances in film ever. Along with its other Oscar nomination for Best Sound, Young Frankenstein's screenplay is something every comedy writer should aspire to, which is why Mel Brooks himself said Gene deserves first-hand credit for creating such a masterpiece of comedy that Gene himself couldn't stop cracking up on set, having 10, 15, 20 takes sometimes. Rightfully so, just as millions of others as well, Gene has always rated Young Frankenstein as his own personal favorite film he's ever done. It is a bit tragic that his acting career on film and TV was very short-lived, despite the horrible conclusion of his lymphoma diagnosis along with Alzheimer's. However, more than acting, more than directing, Gene loved to write. Not only his excellent and beautiful memoir, Kiss Me Like a Stranger, but five best-selling books. It is comforting to know he would spend the last years of his life painting and relaxing with his lovely wife, Karen, and spent the last few minutes of his life listening to his favorite song, Over the Rainbow, sung specifically by Ella Fitzgerald. Gene Wilder to this day, folks, shall always be known as one of cinema's and theater's greatest treasures, for he was another example of the everyman, the silent and comforting neurotic, who had just enough confidence and strength as anybody, and every character he played, he gave them such beauty, and he lived happily ever after. <laughs> Do you agree with my picks, folks? What are your favorite performances by this genius wild man, Gene Wilder? Share in those comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe like crazy. Don't forget to become a member of my channel with just a small subscription to more content as well as on Patreon. Any support is greatly, greatly appreciated from you all. Until next time, my friends, thank you so much for watching. And in the meantime, good day, sir.